and it's exciting. My father was a doctor, still is a doctor, all my life. Um, but I didn't see how it actually could work until I was following Pastor Doug Venn around in Bangkok. Uh, within the time that I was there, they did an evangelistic series, spent about $25,000, and brought in two people. And then they also did a uh, health expo downtown, biggest shopping mall in the city. Over 4,000 people came through, and 400 people signed up for further spiritual guidance. Amen. So God is good. The, uh, before I start my program, or the sermon, the message that God has given me, I just want to say a couple of things. Number one, thank you for having me here. I've been so blessed, not only with the programs and uh, the insights, but also the friends that we have made. I feel like this is another home, and, then when, and we're going to have a good time when we get to heaven. Amen? Amen. And gather around the uh, Mid-America tree. <laughs> uh, many people that I talk to when we make an offering appeal say, there's so many different ministries to give to. How do we know what to give to? I have this little quote that came to me just as, we were, as you were making your appeals for such amazing, beautiful ministries. And this is what she says. The light of the gospel shining from the cross of Christ rebukes uh, selfishness and encourages liberality and benevolence. Benevolence is kind of an old-fashioned term. just means generosity. Okay. It should not be a lamented fact that there are increasing calls to give. Present truth, amen? God in his providence is called... This is why there's increasing calls to give. It's not just random. This is the reason. God in his providence is calling his people out from their limited sphere of action. We think we're having big plans. In his eyes, our plans are too small. Unlimited effort. What kind of effort? Unlimited. Unlimited, Unlimited effort is demanded at this time when moral darkness is covering the world. Many of God's people are in danger of being ensnared by worldliness and covetousness. They should understand that it is his mercy that multiplies the demand for their means. Praise God. Objects that call benevolence into action must be placed before them or they cannot pattern after the character of the great exemplar. And I believe that this is Satan's plan to remove missions from our churches so that we don't see that there's a need out there. And we just carry on as usual, comfortably slumbering. If we can just slumber a little longer, Satan has, his, has us. But shall we do that? No. And who's in charge of whether we're sleeping or not? Yes, I'm in charge of me. I, I may not be able to wake the church up, but I can wake me up. Right? And if I wake up, maybe somebody else will wake up. You know, there's a world that's starving, as, as, as our doctor said. There's a world that's starving for the gospel. And taking hold of taking that to them is what invigorates us. There's a story told by Mrs. White. A man was traveling through the snow, and those of you that live in cold climates can understand this. My, this story would, fall, would break apart in, in, uh, if I told it in, in, in Thailand. <laughs> but he was coming to the end of his life because he was freezing. He was cold, and, and, and he couldn't go any farther. And then he heard the moans of a friend or of another traveler laying down in the snow, and his life was almost at an end. So he picked up this man, you know, brushed his skin and tried to reinvigorate him and carried him and, and, and was able to get home. And then he realized that it was in the effort of carrying this man saved his own life. And it's cold out here, isn't it? And worldliness, disinterest in God, all these things, it makes us feel cold. But in carrying somebody else, that's the ticket, I believe. And that is the gift from Christ to save our own souls. The title today is Incorrect English, for those English teachers out there. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm taking a artist liberty to, to do this, okay? Okay, so I want to, as 
to, to, before I begin this actual sermon, <laughs> I'm going to put this in there also. Because, you know, Adventists, we are known for a great amount of knowledge. We have great knowledge of the Bible, great insight, great understanding of the prophecies and truths and stuff that God has given the people. But at the same time, I believe that it is our um, tendency and unique, what can we say, temptation to depend on our knowledge. And the knowledge can tend to separate us from the rest of the world in not so pretty ways. And so I think the solution is found right here by Paul saying that knowledge puffeth up. In other words, knowledge kind of makes us a bit prideful. But charity edifieth. So I believe that as the knowledge that we have, if we, if we can combine the knowledge with works of charity, with caring for others, with caring for the poor, for, with coming in close contact with those that are not of our faith, that that will kind of have a leavening effect of us, on us. I know that a lot of times when we're overseas, we, we think that, you know, a lot of people think that if we just think the right way, we'll make it to heaven. Or that Christianity is some kind of idea that we have in our head. It's not. It's so much more than that. It's a, it's a seed of life that's planted in the soul that springs up into Christ-like action for others. Okay. We're going to go through the prodigal son really quick. The, the um, context here is that Jesus was, uh, actually he was standing there or somewhere in Jerusalem or wherever he was in Israel and, and people were being drawn to him and the people that were being drawn to him were sinners and the Pharisees didn't like that. They complained. And so he started telling a whole different picture. Now these Pharisees, they were religious people. They were people of the book. They knew their Torah backwards and forwards, and, and yet they didn't have a right picture of who God is, okay? And Jesus came, and, and he was attracting those sinners to him. They were drawn to him, and they were complaining about that. And so Jesus started to teach some parables to try to show them what God's heart is really like. Okay, you remember the first parable is the parable of the sheep. And then we have the parable of the coins. And the third parable is the parable of the prodigal son. And I'm going to start out with here. A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that follows and Give me my inheritance. And what did the father do? He gave it to him. Was the far, father required to give it to him? No. So why did the father give it to him? He loved him. He loved him. Do you think that the father was selfish? The father was generous, right? He was very generous. Generous maybe to a fault. He's a generous man. So he gave this younger son half of his wealth, and it didn't seem to bother the father. It didn't seem to faze him. He must have been fabulously wealthy to give away. I mean, if I gave away half, well, I wouldn't give away half my wealth. I'd give half, away half my debt. <laughs> I don't think my kids would ask me for that. <laughs> but not many after da days after that, the younger son gathered everything that he had and took his journey into a far country and wasted all of his money on riotous living. And when he had spent all, there came a famine in the land, and he went and joined himself to a citizen and started working, and he got really, really hungry. Now, this is my experience in the world. Um, I was born and raised in the church, went to Adventist elementary school, high school, college. Finally, after I got married, we moved away from my parents, and I was able to live my own life and do everything that I wanted to do. And I got really, really miserable. I got bored, and I, got, I felt like, you know, I was living two-dimensionally, whereas in the past I'd had that three-dimensional life experience when you have the connection with the Father in heaven. That spirit, once you taste Him, you really can't go anywhere else. So... For six months, I lived like that, and I'm like, I, I got to go back to my father. When he came to himself, when he came to himself, he says, what am I doing? My father's hired servants are better off than I am. And so he, he says, I'll, I'll rise and go to my father. And he did that. He came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Now, what was the son's reason for not thinking that he could be his son anymore? 
The son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. So what was he basing his sonship, his relationship with his father on? His, his works, his performance. Okay? Does it sound familiar? Yeah. So many times I, I look at my life and I'm like, what? What's the point? <laughs> I'm such a loser. How can I claim a promise of God when I have been living like this? How can I claim his forgiveness? How can I claim his healing when I've, when I've been living like this? But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Was the father looking at his performance? Because the father said, and bring the fatted calf and kill it. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he's found. The father was not looking at what the son had done. The father was looking at the fact that this is his son. This is his son. His love for the son was dependent on his, the fact that he was the son, not the fact that he had done all these wonderful things. And those of you that have had children, when your baby is first born, do you love your baby because of all the wonderful things it has done for you? <laughs> I mean, really, all it does is cry and produce smelly substances. <laughs> and it kind of looks cute, but it looks cute to the mom and the dad mainly, you know? It's not that... I mean, but why do we love it then? Because it's our child. It's our child. And we pour everything we have into that child. The love and the tenderness and, you know, if there's something we need to buy for that child to, to make it have a happy life, we'll buy it. Spend whatever is needed for that child, not because it's done anything worthwhile to deserve it, but because it's our child. Now, you're a child of God. And no matter what you do, either good or bad, he will always see us as his child, as his son or as his daughter. There are some times in my life where I think, well, why do anything good if it's not going to earn any favor or anything like that? We'll get to that later. Okay. So the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put, it on, and put a ring on his hand. Now this ring, what does the ring signify? In the old days, it was like giving him the credit card. Because you could sign for something in the wax with, the, you know, he could go down to the store and say, I'd like to buy 50 pounds of rice. And, uh, okay, that's going to cost $500. Well, here's my ring. Oh, you're, you're his son. Okay, he's good for that. Just take it, you know. We'll send the bill later. So he's like giving him the family credit card. This guy had just gone, gone out and spent all this money on half the father's wealth, and the father gives this. What does that say about the father? He's generous. Is he worried about the money? No. Okay. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked, what are these things, what do these things mean? And the servant said to him, Your brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And the elder brother was angry and would not go in. Okay. So you have an elder brother. You have a father. And the elder brother, where's the elder brother been living? With the father. So you have the elder brother living with the father, but... How come there's such different attitudes, spirits, between the two? Okay, let's look at this. He came, therefore, his father came out. This is an amazing thing. His, the elder brother was angry, so what did the father do? He came out. He didn't like, oh, that ingrate, in, in, ungrateful elder brother. He came out and entreated him. And the, father, and the elder brother said, And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet you never gave me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which has devoured your living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. Okay, let's look at, let's analyze a little bit about what the elder brother was focusing on. Okay, first of all, he, what, what, what did he do for his father? 
He served him. He was a servant. Okay? He served his father, neither transgressed I thy command at any time. So he obeyed his father. He served his father. Did he know his father? No. He had no clue. He had no clue what his father was really like. Could he have known his father? Yes. He could have looked and seen what his father had done to his, to his younger brother and how he'd given him all that money and, and, the, and, and how he welcomed him and said, oh, my father's very generous. But he, he was living with the father and not recognizing who the father was. That was me. That's us. Uh, between these two brothers, I used to be the prodigal son. Now I'm the son that's staying at home. I'm serving God. I'm doing everything I can for him. Investing my whole life. Totally sold out. Whatever he wants. Yeah, I'll do it. But do I really know the Father? Am I really seeing him for who he is? And I think this is binding up a lot of our church members. Is that we are in the church. We're in the truth. We're obeying what Christ has told us to do. We're going to church on Sabbath. We're not eating pork. <laughs> We're not even drinking milk. You know? And what's our hope? Our hope is that someday he'll come and take us home to heaven. We're hoping for the big payoff. The big inheritance. And this elder brother was looking at the big inheritance. His inheritance, I'm sure he was working day in and day out. He'd leave home in the morning. Well, I've got to go to work and work for my dad so that someday, you know, things will change. And we'll come into our inheritance. And things will be different. <laughs> so he's looking for the payoff. And what did the father say? And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me. And all that I have is thine. Now, let, let's stop a second here. I mean, think about this. All that the Father had was his? That means, I mean, he's complaining because his Father didn't throw him a party. And the Father says, everything that I own is yours. You could have had a party every night of every week for the last 20 years if you'd wanted to, if you'd asked, if you'd known who I am. And I, and I think back about that. I mean, I think this, I imagine this is a big ranch with a big farm and big farmhouse. And I imagine what would it have been if the brother had, you know, he's out working in the field and he's like, you know, I really like to have a party. But instead of thinking my dad's really hard and someday in the future I'll get that, but not right now. But what if he thought, you know what? I'm going to go see, I'm going to talk to my dad. I'm just going to ask him. So he goes wandering in the farmhouse. Has anybody seen my dad? Servants are, yeah, he's out on the front porch. What's he doing on the front porch? <laughs> so he goes out, Dad, um, you got a minute? Yeah, sure. So, um, Dad, I was thinking about getting together with some friends. and I, I don't want to, you know, cost too much, but maybe just a couple little things, a little party treats or something, maybe some Fritos or something we could, we could have and we could have a little get together. What do you think the dad would say? Sure. Everything that I have is yours. Serious? Okay. So he goes and he goes down to the, the local store and he uses his ring, his credit card, buys some Fritos, goes home and has a nice little party and, and then the next day he goes back to his dad on the porch. Dad, why are you, st your dad's still on the porch. Like, Dad, that, Dad's like, did you have a good time? Yeah, Dad, that was awesome. We had so much fun. Um, maybe we can have another party, like, in a couple years? Well, why wait a couple years? Oh, really? Okay, well, next week. Okay. Do you mind if we buy, like, a small kid? All that I have is yours. Really? Hey, Dad, you want to come? So they go and have a party again. And he gets to know his dad a little bit. Then one day he goes to see his dad and he's still sitting out on the porch. Dad, why are you sitting on the porch all the time? Oh, I'm waiting for your brother. Are you kidding me? That guy that took half of your entire 
what do you call it? Estate. Estate, wealth. Yeah, your entire net worth. He took half of that. You're waiting for him to come, what, to like to blow up or something? He's like, no, I'm hoping he'll come down. I'm hoping he'll come home. And, and this, this porch here, I can get a good view right down the road. Someday, I think, I'm hoping, I'm praying he's going to come down the road. What are you going to do when he comes? Oh, man, I'm going to throw the biggest party you've ever seen. Serious? You, you love that guy? Still? Yeah. But what about me, Dad? Son, all that I have is yours. I love you. I love you so much. I would die for you. Really? So all that you have is mine? Yes. And you love me? Yes. So I don't have to work for you? No, you don't have to work for me. But I, but I could work for you. Oh yeah, sure. What if, Dad, Dad, would you be okay if I went looking for your brother? I mean, my, my brother? What do you think the father would say there? Dad, it, it kind of costs some money. It's going to cost some money to get to the last known city that my, elder, my younger brother was in. Would you sponsor me? What do you think the father would say? No, I'm getting a little low this month. <laughs> yeah, what do you need? All that I have is yours. And if that, what if that brother had entered into the father's heart? What if that brother had spent enough time with the father to understand where the father's heart really lied? And when that brother came home, he wouldn't have been angry, would he? He'd have been rejoicing. And all along, he could have been having a party every night. Instead, he was burdened, he was weighed down, he was doing all this stuff so that someday maybe he'd get the reward. What a tragedy. But isn't that the way we are? I know that's the way I am. I'm the elder brother. I used to be the prodigal son, but I'm the elder brother. I'm in church. I see God up there. I want to serve him. But he's looking down at us and he's saying, what's he saying? I mean, this, this is representing the Father in heaven. Okay? And the Father in heaven is telling us, all that I have is yours. Whoa. How much does the Father in heaven have? He has a lot. <laughs> he has a lot. He has the whole world, all the gold, all the cars, all the cattle. I don't know how much cattle is worth. I'm not really interested in cattle. But he has all the cars. He has all the airplanes. He has all... He, and then this world is just a little drop in the bucket compared to all the worlds that he has out there. The guy is wealthy. He could give away half... And then he looks at you, and he looks at me, and he says, all that I have is yours. Whoa. I mean, does that blow your mind? It blows my mind. Absolutely, irretrievably blows my mind. What do you do with that? I mean, there was a time when I was like serving the Lord, and I was doing all the service for him, and I was really poor. I mean, I'm still poor, but not really. And I, was, I remember driving down the street thinking, you know, my old rattletrap van and thinking, man, I sure am a poor missionary, but, you know, I'm going to bear up under this because that must make me holy. <laughs> I'm serving God and I'm poor and I'm suffering. Look at that Christian over there. He's all wealthy, you know. He's not as holy as I am. And I don't, you know, a lot of times you don't really mean to think that way, but that's just kind of how your human nature kind of comes out. And why does God bring that stuff out? Purify. Not to stuff it back down, not to, 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 um, to condemn us, but to purify us. So I'm driving down the street, I'm looking at the street. You know how much it costs to put in a road? You know all that asphalt? That's a lot of money. I'm thinking, man, I could never afford putting in a road. I'm just a poor missionary. Holy poor missionary. <laughs> and then I'm driving and I see this big old skyscraper. It's like, man, I could never afford a skyscraper like that. I'm just a poor missionary. And then I read this. The Holy Spirit 
got through to me. All that the Lord has is mine. So now I'm driving down the road and I see a Ferrari go by. That's my Ferrari. <laughs> I don't need it right now because it's kind of a headache, maybe a bit of a distraction, so God's letting him manage that. Okay? I don't need to worry about putting in a road, but that's my road. And that skyscraper, it's my skyscraper. I don't need it right now. Can you imagine the headache of running a big building like that? I mean, the Lord's letting them manage it. Still mine. Of course, the flip side to that is all that is mine is His. <laughs> so this idea of me owning stuff, it's, it's just like this temporary construct that we have. But in actuality, everything that God has is ours. Now, as missionaries, do we need to worry? I used to have a job. <laughs> and um, we used to stress a lot more about money than we do now. When, we, when I was working at Pacific Union College, we got a small income, but it was a steady income. We stepped out by faith to serve God. And I don't worry about whether we're going to eat anymore because I know that God can provide. Being dependent on God is much more freeing than being dependent on a job or a bank account or retirement account or anything like that because God's the originator and owner of everything already. <laughs> and so now it's like we can go through life with a different attitude. Lord, I want to have a party. God, I want to have a party. And you might be thinking, what kind of party is he talking about? I'm talking about the party that we find in the next chapter. Luke chapter 16, verse 9. Remember, it starts out with that uh, unjust steward, where the unjust steward is, is found out to be embezzling. So the boss comes and says that you're going to lose your job. And so he gives discounts to all of his boss's debtors. And, 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 the, and the Lord commends him for doing wisely. Now, why was that wise? It was because he was planning for his future. Okay? He was making, taking steps to plan for his future. And Jesus says, Make to yourselves, therefore, friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when, they re when you are finished, they will receive you into heaven. Okay? What is mammon of unrighteousness? Money. Okay? Use your money to make friends, the kind of friends that will be welcoming you into heaven when you are over. And it's like, Lord, that's the kind of party I want. I want a party where I introduce people to Jesus. Sound like a great party? <laughs> Maybe like a Bible study where we can get together and I can, I don't know, some way that we can, and there's a lot of people that we can introduce people to Jesus. That's a possi I mean, the possibilities are endless. So, you may be thinking, okay, you're a little bit crazy. This is a statement from Ellen White that I found just recently. If you have renounced self and given yourself to Christ, you are a member of the family of God and how much? Everything in the Father's house is for you. Wow. Wow. All the treasures of God are open to you, both in the world that is now and in the w that which is to come. So this world, this temporal world, and the, and the world, heavenly world. Okay. Now, talking about the character of God. Okay, this is the character of God. He's incredibly generous. All right? So this is a statement that I found just recently because, you know, you can live inside or near the Father without, like, really getting to know who He is. And so I think that we need to focus our time and our effort and our thoughts on who is the Father really? Who really is the Father? What is His heart like? What is His character like? This is a statement that just blows my mind. The longer we are in the heaven of bliss, the more and more, more and still more of glory will be open to us. And the more we know of God, the more intense will be our happiness. That's crazy. What does that say about God? Okay, now, let's say you have a stove over there, and the closer you get to it, the more intense becomes your heat. 
You get warmer and warmer the closer you get to the stove. What does that say about the stove? It's hot. So if the closer you, and the closer you get to the Father in heaven throughout all of eternity, the more happiness you feel, what does that say about the Father? He's happy. We serve a happy God. That's crazy. I mean, I've just stumbled across this in the last couple of years. Born and raised a Seventh-day Adventist. I knew all the doctrines from a child. I had no idea we served a happy God. I asked one of my friends, he's 11 years old, I says, what do you, how do you think God sees you? You know what his response was? I think he's a little annoyed. <laughs> you know, and where does he get that? He gets that from his parents. I got, I got my vision of who God is from my parents. He's got, you know, the time watch. If I do good, he will reward me. If I do bad, then he'll be kind of upset with me. Okay? He'll, he'll provide this emotional distance to punish me. That's not how God is at all. The longer we are in the heaven of bliss, the more we know about God, the more intense will be our happiness. That means that God is a happy God. That's amazing. The last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of His character of love. Now we're going to move into a, a, um, a portion, a reading from Mrs. White that is very sober. It's very sobering. Divine love has been stirred to its unfathomable depths for the sake of men. And angels marvel to behold in the recipients of so great love a mere surface gratitude. Oh, thanks, God. Thanks for giving me a better life. <laughs> the other thing that this tells me is that we, this gives me permission to, be, to, to have gratitude for God's love. When I grew up in, in my church family, love wasn't really talked about much, you know? A uh, very scientific family. We want the facts and the figures. Uh, love is kind of this foo-foo thing, you know. You don't really can't really define it. So we just don't talk about that. But here it says we can be grateful for his love. Angels marvel at man's shallow appreciation of the love of God. The love of God. Which tells us we need to be much more appreciative of the love of God. All the paternal, this is the parenthetical quote. All the paternal love which has come down from generation to generation through the channel of human hearts, all the springs of tenderness which have opened in the souls of men are but as a tiny rill. Tiny rill means like a little tiny trickle of water compared to the boundless ocean when compared with the infinite exhaustless love of God. That's a lot of love. That's a huge amount of love. How strong is God's love? Stronger than death. The cross was just a little glimpse of the principle that constantly abides in the heart of the Father, which means if God, if Christ had to go to the cross again for you, he would do it. Second time, he would do it for you. Heaven stands indignant at the neglect shown to the souls of men. We're back to the main quote. Now, this is kind of interesting because it says, angels marvel at man's shallow appreciation of the love of God, and heaven stands indignant at the neglect shown to the souls of men. I wonder if the shallow appreciation of the love of God has any connection with the neglect shown to the souls of men. And I wonder if we had a deeper appreciation for the love of God, if our neglect for the souls of men would decrease. Our, maybe our, if our interest, maybe our interest in the love of, in, in the souls of men would increase as we looked more closely and had greater appreciation for the love of God. Amen. So I think this is a source issue with us. Remember, knowledge puffeth up. We have lots of knowledge in our church. Where is the love? And I'm not saying we need to generate this love. We cannot generate this love. I can't generate this love. I'm a selfish person. Ask my wife. 
But God so loved the world, and he wants to live in me. The things that I do, I cannot do. I cannot do anything of myself, anything good of myself, but he doeth the works. He places that love. And that is his mission, that is his goal with every single one of us. I, when I first heard that, I thought that was too simplistic. I thought his goal for me was to have this person that acted like this and did this and was like this. But no, his goal for me, his mission, his entire mission to me is to plant his love for the world in my heart. He just wants me to care. That's his mission. That's his goal. And Mrs. White says that Christ died on the cross so that he'd have a church that would care about the world. Amazing. So simple. So amazing. Would we know how Christ regards this neglect shown to the souls of men? How would a father and mother feel did they know that their child, lost in the cold and the snow, had been passed by and left to perish by those who might have saved it? Would they not be terribly grieved, wildly indignant? Would they not denounce those murderers with wrath hot as their tears, intense as their love? The sufferings of every man are the sufferings of God's child, and those who reach out no helping hand to their perishing fellow beings provoke his righteous anger. This is the wrath of the Lamb. All of a sudden, that little wrath of the Lamb in Revelation takes on a whole new meaning. It may not be just those wicked people out there. It may be me here in the church that just sits on the pew. To those who claim fellowship with Christ, yet have been indifferent to the needs of their fellow men, he will declare in the great judgment day, I know you not whence you are. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Now I'm coming back to this graph. I've shown it in both of my other sermons here at ASI Mid-America, but some of you weren't here. And I want to let this sink in because this is where we are as a church, as a people. And I count myself in this as well. But this is from 1933 all the way to 2005. Um, and this is from, this is mission offerings through the NAD. I got this from the Adventist archives by copying from their quarterly reports and, uh, and then uh, adjusted for inflation through the uh, government's website. Um, in 1933, if somebody gave $10 in tithe, they would give another $6 towards foreign missions. Today, I give about 28 cents. If we add in all supporting ministries and everything, it may be up to about there. Does this look like a church that's filled with God's love? No. No. Does this look like a church that has a lot of opportunity to change? Absolutely. Because God gave his greatest promises to the Laodicean church. Absolutely. Um, this is uh, actually where I first got the idea of what was happening. Uh, I'll play this little clip. If there's audio for the computer, okay. I need to turn it on here. I'm giving. Okay, I'm going to start over. In the 1930s, a person would give $10 in tithe. Also, I'm going to start over. I am very concerned of the fact that there's been a very great decline in mission offering giving. Back in the 1930s, a person would give $10 in tithe, also gave $6 in mission offerings. Today, a person giving $10 in tithe would give only 28 cents. I'm not a mathematician, but I'd say you can't grow a mission program worldwide that way. Yeah. <laughs> It's quite passionate. So what about the progress of Christianity? As I shared earlier, 39% of the world has established churches or established uh, Christianity in them. 19% of the world is nominal. 42% of the world's population is still considered unreached. So there's still opportunity for us to go and have a lot of parties. <laughs> okay, I want to talk about the wedding feast really quick. I, I can do this in three, two minutes, one minute. Okay. 
Remember the wedding feast of Matthew 22 where the king had a son who was going to get married, so he sent out the invitation to all the people that were bidden, but they refused to come. And then, so he sent out the invitation to all those people in the highways and byways. They were coming as not the groom, not the bride, but they were coming as guests. What do guests do at weddings? They watch and they eat. <laughs> so where in the, in the Gospels do we see somebody watching a marriage and rejoicing at the marriage? Wasn't it John the Baptist when he says, I am not the Messiah, I am the friend of the groom that rejoices to hear his voice, okay? So he rejoiced to see people introduced to Jesus. Okay, they also eat. Where do in, in the Bible do we, or in the Gospels, do we hear of somebody being satisfied by eating? It was Jesus, the woman at the well. I have food that you know not of. He was satisfied by someone being introduced to eternal life. Okay, so this is our banquet, is taking the Gospel to the world, introducing people to Jesus, is our spiritual feast, okay? It's like, it's like this wedding feast. All right, so this is our banqueting table. All the red um, in this division, there is about still about 1,200 languages or more that we have no known Adventist work in at present. If we continue the way that we are in entering new languages, according to Clyde Morgan, uh, formerly of AFM, he says, if we continue entering new languages at the current rate that we are entering new languages, it'll only take us 600 years to enter those languages. But if there is a revival in missions, let's say 10% of just North American membership went as missionaries to unreached people groups. That would be over 100,000 missionaries. 6,000 people, people groups wouldn't be that big of a deal. Okay, again, this is where the unreached people are, the 1040 window. And I want to go to one specific area, this place in Thailand, this whole area here, and much of this over here has not a single Adventist member in the entire area. And we're going to look at Sukhothai. Sukhothai is this city of about 35,000. There are many areas in the world, there are many cities in the world in which there are no Adventists at all. This is like a foray deep into unentered area. This entire valley has no Adventist church, no Adventist member, no Adventist presence at all. And that shouldn't be, because I believe God has his children right here. So we're claiming Joshua 1.3 today. It says, wherever you place the sole of your foot, I have already given it unto you. So God is opening up a door here in Sukhothai for the establishment of a beacon of light here in this city. What do we need to, to make this happen? Well, the first thing is we need somebody. Somebody that's willing to give their lives to come and pursue God's kingdom in this place. So there's a place with not a single Adventist presence. I'm happy to say that right now there's a retired couple that is visiting right there and they're thinking about moving there just to live there. There are hundreds more places. There's a city just south of this, that city, about four hours, 125,000 people, not a single Adventist, no preacher, no congregation, no church, no missionary, nothing. And one of the appeals I want to make today, Thailand is a beautiful place to live. A lot of people retire to Thailand. What if you moved there and moved into a neighborhood? Very good chance you'd be the only Christian they've ever seen. They could watch your life. You wouldn't have the spirit house out front to guard your family from evil. And they would say, how can you live without that? Start asking questions. That's an appeal. And the other appeal is to do this in your churches. Let the gospel message ring through our churches, summoning them to universal relaxation. <laughs> universal action. Take up some work. Let the members of the church have increased faith, gaining zeal from their unseen heavenly allies, from a knowledge of their what resources? Exhaustless resources, from the greatness of the enterprise in which they are engaged, and from the power of their leader. 
Let the members of the church have increased faith, gaining zeal. Oh, we already read that. Oh, that's the wrong button. <laughs> Those who place themselves under God's control to be led and guided by him will catch the steady tread of the events ordained by him to take place. Inspired with the spirit of him who gave his life for the life of the world, they will no longer stand still in impotency, pointing to what they cannot do. Are you tired of standing still? I'm tired of standing still. Putting on the armor of heaven, they will go forth to the warfare, willing to do and dare for God, knowing that his omnipotence will supply their need. I want to finish the last 30 seconds with a little investment strategy that I recommend to all of you. Yes. Um, I want you to think about this rope as going on forever. It goes out past uh, Denver and on past the universe and Galley, Milky Way, everything. This is your life, okay? All right? Your life can go on forever. This little part here, this tape, is your life on Earth. And we come to consciousness here and we work really hard. We go to school and school and study, study, study and work really hard so that we can live really good right here. And we often forget about all this. What if we could take all, everything that we have in our life and invest it so that at the moment we cross this border and we come face to face with Jesus, we don't have those regrets. And yet we can come to him and say, everything that this life has, I've invested in the next life. This is what Paul did. Everything that he had, every resource, his imagination, his everything, he, was, he invested so that he would have a recompense in the next life, a glory with, that's without compare. He said of this life, if there is no resurrection, <laughs> of all men I've had the most miserable life because he had a terrible life. He was shipwrecked a bunch of times, killed several times, he was whipped. I mean, he had a terrible life. Why? Because he was investing everything he had into the next life. Now, what kind of life is he going to have when he gets to heaven? I know I'm going to go consider him a friend. You know, all the people that he's going to meet there that will say, it's because of you, I'm here. And this is our opportunity right now to invest everything that we have so that when we get to heaven, our reward. There was a time when I was in India and I was, I've been struggling really hard to do the Bible worker thing and get them supported. And, and they were, I was at a baptism and there was like five people getting baptized and I look at the people that are getting baptized and I'm like, they're not very pretty. They're just some old ladies in two dollar saris and it's like, man, if... And then the Lord kind of... <laughs> and says, imagine what they're going to look like when they're in heaven. And God himself puts a robe of light around them and they have perfectly clear skin and have a gold crown. And what if a billion years from now, it's one of those lady stands up to direct the choir of heaven. Will I consider that a worthwhile investment? Absolutely. So this is my appeal for you today. Consider what we can invest. There's nothing too precious that we cannot invest for Christ. And ask him, God, I want a big party. Thank you.